guys, today we're going to read The Amazing Impossible Erie Canal. Woo Enjoy, enjoy learning about the Erie Canal. So there's lots of places in our area where you can uh, see place parts of the old Erie Canal, which is pretty neat. Alright, there's lots to unpack here in this book. After a second war against Great Britain, the War of 1812, the people of the United States were feeling confident about the future of their expanding nation. Thousands of pioneers struggled over a rough barrier, the thickly wooded Appalachian Mountains that extended down the continent. On the other side was the tantalizing west, stretching clear in, uh, to the Mississippi River and beyond. Settlers' wagons jolted miserably down roads that once had been Indian trails. When farmers and fur trappers got to the lonely frontier, they found it cost too much and took too long to ship apples, flour, wood, and pelts to the eastern markets. Eastern merchants had no way uh, to, no easy way to sell axes, plows, and buttons to customers in the West. It took nearly a month or more to get a barrel of flour from the shores of Lake Erie along the Mohawk Trail to the Hudson River. However difficult, this passage followed a natural gap in the Appalachian Range. Since ancient times, native people such as the Senate Senecas and the Onondagas had floated their light canoes along the Mohawk River, Wood Creek, and Oneida Lake on the ways to Lake Ontario and Erie. They carried the, their canoes around the rapids over land and through valleys where boats couldn't go. European colonists moved their heavy flat bottom boats in the same waterways. They too had to work around the obstructions. Why not connect these rivers and lakes with man-made streams as in the old country, they wondered. Smoothly floating boats could be pulled along by horses walking on the bank. After the War of Independence was over in 1783, George Washington himself championed the idea of such canals. Travel and trade made easy and cheap would hold a young country together. If such a waterway was constructed between the Great Lakes and the Hudson, a person could float from Ohio clear to London. It seemed an impossible dream. If only the millions of dollars could be raised. If only all of the engineering problems could be solved. A ditch 40 feet wide, carrying 4 feet of water, could be made to go up and down the 363 miles across the countryside. Impossible. Nevertheless, a politician named DeWitt Clinton argued that the canal was more than possible. It was necessary, not only for New York, but for America. It would be a pathway into the country's heartland. The people agreed, and Mr. Clinton became governor. On a long-awaited summer morning, gentlemen wearing tall silk hats gathered in a meadow near Rome, New York, in the level center of the state where the digging was easy. Romans wore their best clothes, and a band played fanfare on shiny cornets as the ground was broken for the Erie Canal at dawn on the 4th of July, 1817. Miss says, How the Canal Was Built, 1817 to 1825. I'm not going to read every word there for you, but um, it shows how locks work. It shows that bridges that carry water um, were, are called aqueducts, and they're built to carry the canal over rivers and valleys. No, you stay here. Thank you. It says, after the groundbreaking at Rome, July 4th, 1817, then came the stake setters, the soil borers, the underbrush grubbers, and the tree chopper downers, stump pullers and root cutters, ditch diggers and dirt movers. Hundreds of workers came from hungry Ireland, they overcame their fears of American wildcats, owls, and snakes. Hard workers dug in and created the Erie Canal, 363 miles long, the longest uninterrupted canal in the world. Five years later, the people were worried the project would never be paid for or finished. The governor lost his job. Mr. Clinton kept overseeing the work and making speeches anyway. His political enemies called the canal Clinton's Ditch. But the voters felt better as they traveled more at and more on the almost finished waterway, which was already earning money in tolls. For example, one penny for one ton of grain hauled one mile. Mr. Clinton won the election of 1824. The following year, the impossible Erie Canal was done. Clinton's ditch was said with pride. It was a time to celebrate. It says 10 o'clock Wednesday morning, October 26, 1825. Boom! The Buffalo Cannon thundered. It was echoed by a distant thump from Black Rock to the north. Birds fluttered up in clouds from the bright fall treetops. Gun by gun, from Lake Erie, 363 miles down the amazing ribbon of water, and down the Hudson River to the sea, the news was signaled. 
after eight years of work, the Erie Canal was done. Four gray horses headed down the towpath, pulling the Seneca chief, Governor DeWitt Clinton's packet. The Seneca chief was followed by four more packets, as the sleek horse-drawn passenger boats were called. Loud was, were the cheers of the crowd and the music from the band, and louder still were the rifle salutes fired into the sky. Besides people, the Seneca chief carried green-painted kegs of water from Lake Erie for the ceremony at the end of the journey. Lake water poured into the salty Atlantic Ocean would mean the waters of the east and west were connected at last. It was called the Wedding of the Waters. The gaily decorated horses clopped clopped at four miles per hour. Every 10 miles or so, fresh teams of horses or mules replaced the tired animals on the towing ropes. More canal boats joined the procession at Lockport. They they were all floated 63 feet down the double stair step locks, already famous as, the, as great feats of engineering. The locks were built into massive ridges of limestone, the toughest obstacle in the path of the canal. The people on the packets stared, full of wondering, as the fitted stones in the wet wall at the fitted stones in the wet walls as the gates were opened and closed, allowing water to flow out uh, to the next lock lowering the boats one by one, level by level. Amazing. After feasting fireworks and speeches at Lockport, the parade of boats continued east, past bonfires on bluffs and cabins with candles burning in every window. Late into the October night, the governor stood with the captain at the tiller, watching bats and moths dance in the lantern light. The tow ropes made shimmers on the dark water. Clinton thought of the long years of hot debates and hard digging, but he savored the sounds of cowbells, bullfrogs, and steady hoofbeats on the tilt. In the rainy afternoon on the second day, the growing procession of boats reached Rochester, nearly 93 miles out from Buffalo. The next morning, the boat, boats passed under an arch at Macedon, where the banner hailed Clinton and the canal. With bellies full of breakfast, ears full of patriotic speeches, on the passengers went. Bridge, called the driver boys up ahead. Low bridge, puffing, grumbling, and laughing. The ladies and gentlemen ducked down low as the farmers and villagers of the bridge shouted, hurrah. Jules, can we quiet down the coloring a little bit while we're reading the story? Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> the 29th of October marked the fourth day of the great journey to the east. The boats were towed to Syracuse for a celebration supper. Sunday morning on the fifth day, the Seneca chief was greeted by the villagers of Rome. It was here that the digging had begun eight long years before. Between Rome and Utica, 15 minutes east, miles east. <clears throat> nope, it's almost over. You're going to sit still, please. Thank you. The Erie Canal had been open since 1819, but now, to the Roman sorrow, the main waterway ended by bypassing the center of the village where only a bit of the old canal remained. Some put aside their hurt feelings to cheer the governor and the packets from the west. <clears throat> Congratulations, governor, shouted the pathmaster, and to your lady. Mr. Clinton tipped his hat as his wife nodded her silk bonnet. The pathmaster's job was to keep cows, pigs, fishermen, and buggy racers off the towpath. He carried a bundle of straw on his back for plugging leaks made by pesky minks and muskrats tunneling, tunneling under the banks. I think we saw that when we were walking along the towpath. I saw these little um, animals, I think, were muskrats. I don't think we saw muskrats, but I think we saw muskrat poop. Okay. <laughs> we saw all sorts of poop. That was a poopy walk because people she ride their horses on the towpath. Anyway, if a canal bank gave way, farmers' fields could be flooded, leaving a muddy ditch and stranded boats. On the night of the sixth day was Halloween. Jules were still reading. <laughs> Bonfires burned along the crags and cliffs at Little Falls, where the wild Mohawk River foamed and crashed 30 feet below the triple-arched aqueduct that carried the canal eastward. The procession floated 94 feet downward through 13 locks along the 40 miles to Schenectady. Inside the boats the next morning, the people could hear cold November rain on the roof. The steersmen at the tillers pulled their collars high about their ears, their, the horses on the towpath lowered their heads. 26 more stone and timber locks carried them 218 feet deeper down the last 30 miles of the river valley into the sunny morning of November 2nd, 1825. It had taken just seven days to go from Buffalo to Albany, where the Erie Canal emptied into the Hudson River. 
Thousands of people lined the canal banks, towpath, and berm. Brass bands, school children, and veterans of the War of 1812 waited with old soldiers of the Revolution who polished their medals and muskets. Some folks dressed in Dutch colonial costumes they'd found in their pointy attics. Cannon fire vibrated the air. Here they come! Governor Clinton stepped down off the Seneca chief to preside over a pageant of lofty words and entertainments. Banners read peace and commerce, and the grand work is done. November 3rd. This bright autumn day, a multitude gathered to see a fleet of eight steamships shooting sparks, white columns of steam, and black plumes of smoke. Canal boats, all decked out with flags and streamers, set off down the wide river. The fleet glided <coughs> past the red gold Catskill Mountains. <coughs> when twilight deepened on the river, lanterns were lighted, cannons thundered, thudded, rockets exploded, and red fires burned on the shores. After a 24 gun salute, West Point officers came aboard the Seneca Chief for a midnight band concert. Then everyone went to bed. Tomorrow would be a big day, the wedding of the waters. Bells were ringing in the towers and steeples of New York City, where more flag and bunting covered steam vessels, barges, and pilot boats joined their fleet. The flotilla sailed past Brooklyn through the Narrows, down to Sandy Hook on the eastern tip of New Jersey. Here at last, DeWitt Clinton lifted a green and gold cask to his shoulder and slowly poured the water from Lake Erie into the unusually calm and glassy Atlantic Ocean. The mixing together of these waters, fresh and salty, western and eastern, represented a huge accomplishment for a young nation. Gold medals, souvenirs of the day, would be sent to President John Quincy Adams, his father John Adams, and other former presidents still living, Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Madison, and Mr. Monroe. After the solemn ceremony, musicians aboard the two British vessels outside the harbor struck up Yankee Doodle in honor of the occasion. The Americans answered with God save the king. More salutes were fired, and then everyone ate breakfast as they sailed, sailed back to the city to watch 5,000 marchers in a festive street parade. Late that night, when the smoke from the fireworks still in the air, folks made their ways home through the dark streets, still talking excitedly. We'll never see the like of that again. Did you see them balls of fire leaping out of the roof of City Hall? Rockets, red dragons, and stars raining down. By golly. What did that one feller say? The longest canal in the world? That's a fact. The longest in the least time with the least experience and, no and know-how for the least money. Seven million dollars is the least money, you say? Why, for the price of shipping, why the price of shipping will drop like an anvil off of the roof. Folks going back and forth in one third the time, as smooth as you please. Say, there's a ride I'd like to take a whirl at myself, the old Erie Canal. The Seneca chief returned to Buffalo with a barrel of seawater. Curious day trippers, New Englanders with Ohio fever, immigrants such as, uh, Immigrants, such foreign travelers as Charles Dickens and the Marquis de Lafayette, as well as families who lived and worked on and about the Erie Canal, all traveled America's first superhighway. The Grand Western Erie Canal had cost seven million one hundred and forty three thousand seven hundred and eighty nine dollars to build. By eighteen eighty three, the canal would earn seventeen times that amount, one hundred and twenty one million four hundred and sixty one thousand eight hundred and seventy one dollars in total revenues. Life in the wilderness was transformed by floating libraries, taverns, showboats, and church homes, with flour, beef, wool, and lumber going east, and boatloads of merchandise and settlers going west on the big ditch. New towns be began, and old towns, especially New York City, got bigger and richer. Most of all, the Grand Western Canal, as it was called, was a source of pride for the nation and a link between old and new states of the Union. In 1831, a steam locomotive began running on, the, on a railway between Albany and Schenectady. As time went by, people wanted to go faster, so they bought railroad tickets, leaving the canal to log rafts, freight boats, and barges. Because of traffic jams, the canal was made wider and deeper. Oh, sorry, I just lost my place. Uh, with more double locks for more boats by 1862. By 1918, the Erie Canal had become part of the huge New York State uh, barge canal system. It, along with U.S. Interstate 90, followed the ancient Mohawk Trail. DeWitt Clinton's once impossible ditch has been bypassed and paved over. Locks left to crumble. But we can still walk those really cool trails like the Schoharie Crossings. In Amsterdam is what? Amsterdam? Orysville. Orysville. New ways have taken its place. So now we have trucks and railroads. Right? I'll post some pictures on our Google Classroom. Bye-bye.